I want you to picture a video game. It can be any video game at all, just in your head, picture a video game. Now, if you're from the US, perhaps the games that came to mind were Mario or Zelda, maybe Sonic or Call of Duty, perhaps you even envisioned Fortnite or Minecraft. These are all household names and incredibly popular, so it makes sense that these would come to mind. Now, if I were to give the same prompt to someone from Japan, it's very likely that another series could come to mind. The series I'm referring to is Dragon Quest. Now, for those of you who aren't from Japan, or you're just unfamiliar, you're probably wondering, well, what is a Dragon Quest? As Wikipedia puts it, Dragon Quest is a series of Japanese role-playing video games created by Yuji Horii and his studio Armor Project. With its first game published in 1986, there are 11 main series games, along with numerous spin-off titles. If you're not too familiar with video games as a medium, you're also probably wondering what a role-playing video game is. Well, to give a loose definition, a role-playing game is a type of video game in which the player controls the actions and sometimes decisions of one or more characters in a defined setting. This is, again, a very broad description of the genre, so maybe just think something like Dungeons and Dragons, but without the limitless narrative capabilities as the game is limited to being a video game. Some contemporary examples would be The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, The Final Fantasy series, and Pokemon. What makes Dragon Quest stand out from these games is the fact that none of them would exist without it. In many ways, Dragon Quest can be considered the father of the role-playing genre of video games. But how did Dragon Quest earn this title? What gave the series its now legendary status? And why is it that the game is so popular in Japan but has never really caught on in North America? To answer these questions and more, we have to take a look back at the origin of the series all the way back in 1986. The development of the first Dragon Quest can usually be attributed to four key individuals. The four individuals I'm referring to are Yuji Horii, Koichi Nakamura, Koichi Sugiyama, and Akira Toriyama. All of them were individually important to Dragon Quest's success, but the one who played the largest role in the development was Yuji Horii. Yuji Horii was born on January 6th, 1954, in Sumoto City located within the Hyogo Prefecture of Japan. Throughout Hori's young life, he alternated between dreams of being a lawyer and a mangaka. A uh, mangaka, for those unaware, is a Japanese term for manga artist, someone who typically writes and draws Japanese comics called manga. By high school, Hori had decided ultimately that he would become a mangaka, as he thought it was much more likely than becoming a lawyer. Hori claims he was so dedicated to becoming a mangaka that in his third year of high school, he burst into the office of Go Nagai, one of the most popular mangaka at the time, and demanded he become his assistant, for he also said that in his young age, he was absolutely shocked when the request was completely denied. Hori would then go on to become a freelance writer after college as a motorcycle accident left him unable to get a formal job as a writer. As a freelance writer, he was one of the first to adopt to using a PC for his writing. This PC would introduce him to several computer games as well as get him started on programming. Eventually, with his background knowledge in computer games and his previous enthusiasm for manga, Hori was able to land himself a job for Weekly Shonen Jump, which was rising as Japan's most popular manga magazine. It was at this job that Hori met the first of the people who would play a large role in Dragon Quest, Akira Toriyama. Toriyama, at the time, was working on his manga Dragon Ball, which was gaining increasing popularity. Continuing his job for Weekly Jump, Hori decided to additionally work on a side project of programming a game and submitting it to a contest held by the Enix Corporation. Months passed and Hori eventually attended the award ceremony held by Enix, both to see how he'd done, but mostly to write about the contest for Weekly Jump. To Hori's surprise, his game titled Love Match Tennis, which had been submitted anonymously, had received a special showcase at the event. Eventually, the winners for the contest were announced with first place going to a game titled Manita No Battlefield and second place going to a game titled Door Door. Wanting to interview as many people as he could, Hori spoke to the second place winner. When Hori asked for this man's name, he was told, My name is Koichi Nakamura, though my friends call me Chun. 
Koichi Nakamura, or Chun as he put it, was the second person Hori met who would go on to be important in the development of Dragon Quest. After this event, Enix would publish the games displayed including both Love Match Tennis and Door Door. The games sold incredibly well, which caused Enix to approach Hori and Nakamura about working on more. With this, Hori would develop the first ever visual novel, Portopia Serial Murder Case. A visual novel, for those unfamiliar with the genre, is a literary game where the story develops based on the reader's choices and actions. Basically, a more interactive choose-your-own-adventure book where all the text is accompanied by an image. Years passed again, and Nakamura, who had just turned 19, started a company with six of his friends that would become the incredibly popular game development company, Chunsoft. Chunsoft would eventually go on to be the lead development team behind Dragon Quest 1 through 5. In 1983, Enix chose to send Hori and Nakamura on a trip to Applefest to look at new technology. It was here that Hori got the chance to play Wizardry and Ultima, two role-playing games, on the Apple II computer. Hori found himself completely enraptured by this style of game. It was this event, along with the release of the family computer, or Famicom, Nintendo's first ever home console, that would become the driving forces behind the creation of Dragon Quest. Enix quickly put Hori and the group at Chunsoft to work developing a game for the Famicom. As a first game, they started simple, with the Famicom port of Portopia. The port sold well, and because of it, Enix allowed the group to begin working on a new project. For this project, Hori and Nakamura were completely in agreement that they wanted to find a way to bring a complex RPG to a simplified console, like the Famicom. The first hurdle they encountered with accomplishing this feat was that role-playing games were built around complex systems. See, role-playing games at this point had extremely in-depth and complicated systems allowing the games to function. Characters would have stats that determine the values of attacks, which players would have to allocate points as they saw fit choosing between whether it was important to be one point stronger in attacking or one point stronger in defending at a certain time. Occasionally characters would be able to attack, use items, defend themselves, all of which was mapped to certain keys on the keyboard. Even basic tasks like exploring the world and checking your items in these games was mapped to the I key on the keyboard or the D key on the keyboard and was far too complex for the Famicom to have. These challenges presented by the necessity of using a keyboard seemed just impossible for the Famicom's two-button controller to overcome. However, Hori was able to use his knowledge from porting to the Famicom, his previous game, Portopia. In this port, all decisions and actions were based on dialogue menus, allowing the player to navigate the game on something like the Famicom. It was this idea that Hori found the solution for the RPG's biggest problem. It was made so that when playing the game, instead of having to press a certain key for a certain action, the player would simply press the A button and all currently available options would be presented in a convenient menu. When the player needed to perform these actions, they'd simply just press A and a menu would pop up giving them the option to either open a door, use stairs, talk to nearby characters, search nearby items, take something from the ground, check their items, cast a spell, or check the character's status. As for combat mechanics, those were also easily reduced to menus. Whenever the player encountered a monster or fiend, a window would appear showing the monster and presenting a menu with the options to either attack, cast a spell, use an item, or flee the battle entirely. As for the complicated level stats, it was made so that instead of the player choosing which stat increased at a certain point, the game would decide instead with each increase of level, resulting in increases in attack, health, and magic. With the groundwork with which to build their game laid out, all that was left was for Hori to plan the game's events, and for Nakamura and the rest of Chunsoft to work on the programming. The game was nearing conceptual completion, but Enix was worried. While Hori and Nakamura were big fans of Ultima and Wizardry, those games did not have the same broad Japanese appeal that Enix was looking for. The game would need something stylistically that would both set it apart from other games at the time, while still drawing in a large crowd of people. This is where Akira Toriyama came in. Dragon Ball had built a mass following, and Toriyama's character design was unique and recognizable. Although he had shown no real interest in video games prior to being approached by Hori and Enix, he quickly joined them with no hesitation. Toriyama would then begin to work on the designs of everything in the game from characters to monsters. His designs had a universal appeal to them as they clearly encapsulated visions of enemies or friends without making anything too menacing or fearsome which would scare children. The most universal of these designs was what would become the series' iconic mascot, the Slime. The game was near completion, and all that was left was music to accompany the game's atmosphere. 
Enix was then quick to find a composer, as when they had released Portopia, they received a letter of praise from composer Suichi Sugiyama. Sugiyama's career dated all the way back to the 60s and seemed perfect for the role. When approached, Sugiyama was eager to join and met with the team to figure out what type of music he would compose. Originally, Nakamura feared that Sugiyama would not be able to compose music well as composing for the Famicom was incredibly difficult and seemed to require the knowledge of a programmer. These doubts, however, were quickly shattered as Sugiyama demonstrated his true compositional talent by creating the perfect songs for the game that were unlike anything heard on a Famicom before. With everything finally having come together, their game was finished. They sent the code over to Enix, where everything was finalized, and after several months, the game was ready to be released. In these months, Hori and Nakamura grew hasty, however, and had already begun to work on the sequel to their game as, regardless of the reception, they believed all players who experienced the first game would be longing to return to the world that Hori and Nakamura had created. Finally, on May 27th, 1986, Dragon Quest was released to retailers all over Japan. Upon the game's release, sales were initially so poor that Enix feared they would lose money. However, this quickly turned around after Hori published several weekly jump articles and word of mouth began to spread surrounding the game. Additionally, Enix began to reveal that a sequel was in development, further increasing buzz about the game. All in all, the game went on to sell 1.5 million copies in Japan. While this number is in no way staggering, it was still high enough to land the game at number 45 on the Famicom's best-selling games of all time. Most importantly, the sales number would be surpassed by every single other game in the series to follow. It was not just the sales that were positive, however, as the game received countless praise for its uniqueness in design ingenuity. The game was enjoyed by kids and adults alike thanks to the broad appeal of the gameplay and designs. Satoru Iwata, the former president of Nintendo, would praise the game and its sequels as he admired that the game was made so that anyone could play it and anyone can enjoy it depending on their different skill levels and interests. In the history of video games, Dragon Quest is seen as the point where the entire landscape of game design changed. Games no longer had to be based on quick reflexes and reaction times, instead, anyone could play these games at whatever pace they pleased. Another important change to the gaming landscape that Dragon Quest brought was the beginning of the idea of narratively driven games. While most games prior had minimum dialogue and story to focus on the gameplay, Dragon Quest instead shifted this, making the gameplay take back seat to the game's world and story. The game was filled to the brim with characters who had unique dialogue that would add to the world as well as give hints to the player where next to take their journey. All in all, Dragon Quest stood as a massive success for both the publisher Enix and the creative minds behind the whole project. The unique gameplay, music, art, and design had solidified the game as an all-time classic. That is to say, at least, a classic among a Japanese audience as, across the sea, Dragon Quest would not see nearly the same success. Three years after Dragon Quest's release in Japan, Enix released an altered version of the game to North America. This version included updates to sprites and visuals, as well as a full translation into English. Along with these changes to the game came unforeseen changes to the game's packaging and name. The artwork of Akira Toriyama, which had given the game much of its success, was completely dropped from the game's box, manual, and marketing. This was done because Enix feared that America wouldn't care much for the game's cartoony art style, instead favoring a more realistic one. This fear would, in hindsight, seem completely foolish, as Dragon Ball Z, the anime adaptation of Akira Toriyama's hit manga, would see massive success in the States during the mid to late 90s. Nevertheless, Along with the removal of Toriyama's art, the title was changed from Dragon Quest to Dragon Warrior. This was done not because of marketing to an American audience, but instead due to the existence of a tabletop RPG in the US called Dragon Quest. Not wanting to infringe upon the trademark, Enix altered the name of the series for all North American releases of Dragon Quest games until the release of Dragon Quest VIII in 2005, when the name was no longer trademarked. 
With all of the changes Enix had made to make the game marketable to a North American audience, they believed it was finally time for the game to see the same success with the massive American market that it had upon its initial release. Unfortunately, such was not the case. Prepare thyself well, Dragon Warrior. Thy most challenging quest ever awaits. Go with speed, but go with patience. Seek out an arsenal, a dragon scale, a torch, and magic herbs. Use wisdom and cunning to choose thy commands, for the Dragon Lord is a fierce rival. Horrible and treacherous minions all guard the evil one's island castle. Are they ready, young one? Yes, King Warren. And so begins a new epic, Dragon Warrior. Nintendo, now you're playing with power. Upon the game's North American release, during August of 1989, the game landed itself at only number 7 on the best-selling games of the month. But the game's lifetime, only half a million total copies were sold. This was a massive blow to Enix, as the American market typically was much larger than the market of Japan, and they had planned for this. This commercial failure to release in North America was not the result of any changes made to the game, but was instead due to the fundamental flaw with the game releasing three years after its Japanese release. A large part of the success of Dragon Quest was due to its unique design and innovation. However, within the three-year gap between releases, many changes Dragon Quest made to the gaming landscape could already be seen in titles that had released in North America. Ultima 3 had itself taken inspiration from Dragon Quest and in the eyes of North American market, it put Dragon Warrior to shame. Dragon Quest was just not able to keep itself afloat among the American market and this trend would continue for the series as Dragon Warrior 2, 3, and 4 would all sell even less copies than the first. To this very day, Dragon Quest continues its success in Japan. To the Japanese people, the series mascot of the slime is just as recognizable a mascot as Mario is to us. This series receives major, albeit weird, brand deals and partnerships all over Japanese media. The latest entry in the series, Dragon Quest XI, was able to sell over 2 million copies just two days after release in Japan. The success is not just in sales, however, as critics and fans continue to praise the latest release as one of the best in the series. And while Dragon Quest realistically will never see the same success in North America that it has in Japan, after over 20 years the series finally got some grounding with the incredibly successful release of the 8th and 9th installments in the series. The success of these games in particular was due to the massive marketing push the games received in North America. Guys, I have an extra ticket to the concert tonight. Take, take me, dude. Take me. Take me. <laughs> Choices, right? In Dragon Quest IX, I had to choose between a martial artist and a warrior to take into battle with me. I chose a warrior. Who will you choose? Decisions, decisions. Choose your posse, your weapons, your strategy. The adventure is yours. Dragon Quest IX, Sentinels of the Starry Skies. Rated everyone 10 and up. The future of the series looks brighter than ever, as development is well underway for the 12th installment in the series and franchise profits sit comfortably at a total above $12 billion. Even now, at the age of 66, Yuji Horii continues to push forth the series that is dear to himself and to countless others. <laughs>